Yeah. All right, call the meeting to order. Would all who wish join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next up, agenda adjustments. Uh, I don't think we have any recommended adjustments. Does anybody else have one? So then we'll go ahead and move on. I would make a motion to approve the minutes of November 1st. Is there a second? A second. Any discussion, questions, or updates, corrections? All those in favor? Pass this five to zero. Next up, warrants. Do we have a list of warrants? Sorry, it's on the I... Is it in agenda. the online warrant version? Ten, it's not on it's, it's warrant 10, April 10, main purse, October 22, and band 30. Okay, I would make a motion to approve regular warrant 10, payroll warrant 10, band warrant 30, and October purse. Is there a second? A second. Any discussion? All those in favor? This is five to zero. Next up, we have public comment. Door is open. Anybody like to make a public comment? Just go ahead and unmute and speak. Seeing no public comment, we'll move on to acknowledgments. Jake? Uh, nothing to say. Uh, just like to acknowledge the uh, girls' soccer team, which won the uh, sportsmanship award. And um, let's see, and the Mamma Mia musical, you can buy tickets online, it starts on Thursday. And, uh, they're clearly taking advantage of the new auditorium. They just sold, I was just buying some tickets and you can see the seat maps. We sold way more tickets than we were ever able to fit into the cafeteria. So that's great. Um, I was gonna say the same thing about Mamma Mia. Also my adorable two youngest kids will be ushers with Ms. McLaughlin, so. There's a good staff for finding your seats. <laughs> no? All right. Um, thank you. I know I'm stealing some thunder from the high school report, but uh, as probably did you as well, uh, that the um, cross country, girls cross country team competed in New England this weekend and came in 10th in the Northeast. So uh, impressive finish. Uh, uh, in particular, Ruth White dazzled once again and uh, broke her own record that was set uh, in that um, race last year by 42 seconds. So, um, you know, Ruth continues to be such an amazing representative for us, not only for her, you know, athletic skill, but also just being a humble spirit and, um, you know, a, a kind soul uh, for two other athletes competing alongside her. Um, also want to recognize our uh, football team from the high school who uh, went to states last weekend, uh, won Northern Maine uh, championship the week before, earned their ticket to state uh, game Saturday, unfortunately didn't come over with the win, um, but should feel very proud from going uh oh and eight last season it, it, i mean there's more i think it's outlined in the board report uh, i read they summarize it nicely from uh you know winless last season to competing for the state uh in the championship game so a great turnaround and and also a great representative of um, our school and i also want to acknowledge we talked about it last uh, meeting, and it is uh, of the level we would do an acknowledgement. We don't need to formally um, approve the donation by Rose Bike. So just once again, want to acknowledge their donation of the bike for uh, this Thank you. We'll go ahead and move on to principal reports. Terry, you want to start? I sure will. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I'll just start by sharing, we held our parent-teacher conferences last week on November 9th and 10th. We offered a hybrid model, so families could choose from either in-person or virtual. Um, the majority of our families actually chose to come in-person, 
which was wonderful, but we also thought it was really important to offer the alternative for those that found it easier or more convenient for their families. And our teachers were so impressed with the turnout and the conversations and the connections that they were able to make with families. I had many teachers expressing how they they were they their hearts were very happy. I guess there's no other way to say it, and that's very much an elementary school thing to say, but um, their hearts were bursting by this personal connection they were able to have with families again. Uh, so that was really wonderful. And our PTO, as lovely as they always are, uh, pro provided dinner both evenings for our staff. Um, so they were very, very much spoiled for their late nights uh, spent. Um, the next thing that I'll highlight from the board report is that we did launch some book studies around the science of reading. We had a group of teachers very eager to get started. Uh, so we have a small morning group that's meeting before school, doing some reading on this topic. We're going to offer a second book study in January in the afternoon for any teachers that would also like to join in the learning around the science of reading. I think this is coming at a very, um, a very timely moment as next school year, we'll be looking at our ELA curriculum and standards. So having the opportunity to delve into this reading this year and then think about that work next year during the curriculum work, I think will be very valuable. Uh, Susan mentioned uh, during the data session about the MTSS team at ASA. So we have been working diligently. There's a core team that meets weekly to look at attendance, behavior and other pieces of data, teacher referrals for students that seem to be struggling. And then we have a larger team that meets monthly with classroom teaching uh, staff on the team. And at those meetings, we're looking at, we're starting to dabble with the SEL um, and the habits of mind component. So teachers, uh, we're able to provide us feedback on how students were doing in terms of social emotional learning competencies and the areas of things um, like skills for learning. Are they able to focus their attention? Do they use positive self-talk when things are challenging? And so the team has been looking at that data and cross-referencing where we might need to go in terms of providing more support and helping students build their grit and their perseverance. So that's been some important work we've been doing. And I think I will leave it at that for now. What questions do you have? Any questions? Thank you. Uh, Richard. Good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, nice to be here tonight. And lots going on at OMS. So I'll just start uh, by summarizing some of the some of the things in the uh, in the board report and, and then have a few new things to add uh, as well as we go through. Uh, now that we're a couple weeks into the second quarter, we're looking back on our quarter one accomplishments in our uh, quarter one celebration breakfast that's coming up on November 22nd. And that would be the Tuesday before uh, thanks, uh, Thanksgiving next week. And uh, our focus is on, you know, we had a recent discussion around awards and uh, our celebration, uh, focus is on student athletes and uh, club members and as well as teaching and learning uh, here at OMS. So, so, so we're looking at really like uh, a whole school celebration and not on individual awards uh, so much. But students will receive honor roll certificates, but those will be handed out privately uh, and, uh, you know, other other other. Well, it's honor roll certificates is, is what we would be handing out. And that would be for A's and B's, all A's or all A's and B's uh, for the quarter. And we will have, uh, you know, donuts and juice and breakfast treats uh, for the students as we'll uh, have that at eight o'clock on Tuesday morning. Uh, on our, our parent teacher conference uh, schedule went very well last week and I have a, an update on numbers. I, I didn't have the numbers at the time of writing the report, but our turnout our, at our in-person uh, uh, parent conference on November 10th was uh, 41% uh, of our students uh, school-wide had uh, attended uh, uh, conferences on our first night. So 41% school-wide. And the numbers broke down by grade. Our 30% of the, our eighth grade families uh, were able to attend, 35% of our seventh grade families. And 
and our highest number is our sixth graders, 54% of our sixth graders uh, families that were able to attend uh, parent conferences. So that those are nice numbers. And uh, Carrie, thank you for reminding me. Our, our PTO uh, uh, group also provided dinner to staff on uh, parent conference night. So that, that was a, a nice, uh, nice of them and uh, very much enjoyed and appreciated. Uh, our second conferences are tomorrow night. Those are virtual. So we had a, an in-person component and a virtual uh, component, uh, 3 to 6 p.m. Uh, tom tomorrow evening. So, uh, so that's our conference schedule. And uh, I'm happy to report we had our OMS Dental Clinic. Uh, I think this is the third year in a row now. And uh, um, uh, so that, that happened uh, yesterday. And we had a, a good turnout. I, I don't have the final numbers, but I think around 30 middle school students were served uh, yesterday uh, at the dental clinic. And I included the mock OMS mock election results. We had, uh, uh, like in, in, in the school election, we had uh, uh, Janet Mills uh, win the governor uh, uh, race, and uh, U.S. Representative Golden came out on top in the, uh, in the House race. So we had that. Our, our uh, student success plans uh, here at OMS were ready to go. In fact, uh, we were pre planning to go today and uh, we had a number of teachers out at some professional development and uh, unexpected absences and they were key players in the uh, implementation of our student success plan. So we, we just put it on hold for today and we're gonna reschedule, but that's happening very soon. And it's like, in the, I would say in the next couple of days uh, that we're gonna roll that out. And uh, I include information for families uh, via school messenger. And what else? We have uh, our athletics uh, program. Uh, uh, many thanks to Mr. Van Dolman and uh, and uh, and and the whole team of individuals actually that come together. And uh, we have a new OMS athletics calendar, uh, a Google calendar uh, in uh, in service now. And uh, so information has been shared out with parents how to subscribe to that. And we also have a new OMS athletics app that's. Uh, it will help us improve our communications as we kick off the winter athletic season, which has started this week. And that's what I have at this time. Great, thank you. Any questions? All right, the high school. Good evening, everybody. Can you all hear me? Okay, good. Um, so yes, you guys, um, did a great job starting off with how much um, we have pride in our school this week um, following the completion of our fall sports season. Um, all of our teams in a variety of ways um, really represented Orno well, represented their teams and themselves well, and we're just immensely proud. So um, as you guys all stated, the cross country teams and football programs ended last weekend with amazing showings. Um, and I also just to add to what all of you said, it, it was also amazing support by a lot of fans and families, um, alumni, community. It was just really um, a great thing to see how many people came out to support our students and our, our programs. So thanks to everybody that was a part of that. Um, we also, as you mentioned, we have, we're once again proud of um, some of our programs that got the sportsmanship awards um, so our cross country teams did as you mentioned our girls soccer teams did um, just really proud of those accomplishments as well because not only does it show that they work together um, to as a team to pull forth in the sports side of of their activity but also in a way of being respectful um, and sportsmanship towards those that they compete against and towards each other while participating so that's something we're very very proud of um, as was also mentioned, Mamma Mia is this week. Um, it is definitely crunch time. Uh, you can feel the excitement and energy in the school. Uh, you can see kids running around in costumes and doing last minute things. I know that they had photos taken yesterday with Mr. Buner, and today I believe they're going to be on the news. So um, if any of you happen to tape the news or watch it later on the web, um, you hopefully will see some of our students represented. But tickets still are on sale. Um, but as Brian mentioned, the, the seats are getting slim. So please buy those if you would like to attend and that will be Thursday, Friday and Saturday at seven and then uh, Sunday at three. Um, our, uh, we also want to congratulate um, our 
students who participated in the Special Olympics bowling event. Um, it was their first, um, our first involvement with that this, this year. And we had seven Orno students attend. Um, with a huge congratulations to Drew Simmons, with it was our top scorer athlete with 138 points. Apparently, he's an amazing bowler. Um, but it was again an opportunity for staff and students alike to really get together and have a great time. Um, and there is another event coming up very soon. I also wanted to thank. Um, or we did, sorry, um, Kim, Heidi, and our student council for putting on the masquerade dance. Uh, it was Friday night, the same time that the middle school had a dance. So that was very interesting for our campus. Uh, but it gave an opportunity for a lot of kids just to have a great time. Some dressed up, some wore costumes, but they all kind of came together, enjoyed some time together, listened to some great music. Uh, and it's just always nice to see when the kids can just really relax and have a fun time. Uh, also, we had our student uh, award committee met yesterday. Um, I reported out the conversation that the board had, as well as some conversations that we've had since. Um, and our plan moving forward is to go um, award by award and input the information into a template and really be critical of the criteria that we utilize, the process for nominations, the process in which we give the awards to ensure that it's it's as bias free as possible, um, as open to, and equitable to all students, and really does do what we want it to do, which is to recognize and celebrate our students for the many wonderful things they all do in their journey and path at, at Orno High School. Uh, so I'm really proud to be a part of that group. And we did decide to meet every Monday moving forward so that we can continue that work uh, and get a lot done this year. And we also are going to, as soon as we get a few of them completed, work on a way to be transparent and share those um, that work with not only our staff and students, but also the community. Um, we also, our winter sports now that fall has come to a close. Winter sports information night will be this Sunday. It is being held virtually. Um, so anyone that's interested in winter activities should attend that. It's at 6 p.m. Um, I did include the Zoom meeting link in our co-principal report, but we'll make sure that it's also in the week in preview once again for um, people to access. And our quarter one came to a close um, and we mailed home quarter one report cards, but we also did not uh, mail home their each student's NWEA scores uh, for ninth grades nine through 11 for parents and, and students to be able to really try to delve into and start to understand. Um, and Meredith Diamond did a wonderful job of sending some information home to families to help them interpret that data. And um, as far as our school environment, um, it's really cool because once again, our uh, JMG program run by Kelsey Weldon ha has started their um, pop-up thrift store, which is provided all by donations from students, staff, and communities members. And it's just really amazing to see um, students who are really in need of those materials, but also just students just coming together and finding something that just they really like and that brings them excitement and sharing it with each other and wearing it the next day and saying, look what I got at the JMG thrift store. And so it's it's just a really neat thing. And this year we're doing it in the lobby. So it's even more, um, you know, a larger space, I guess you can say, so people can access the clothing and, and look through things and really um, have that opportunity together. So it's, it's really neat. It's right outside my office. So I get to listen in, which is nice. Um, and we want to just give a shout out and a thanks to Karen Martin. She held uh, the COVID vaccine uh, clinic on the 28th. Um, of October, and it was a great opportunity for some of our students and staff and community members. So thank you to her. And also, I didn't put it on here because we have yet to do it, but tomorrow and Thursday, the high school will have the opportunity with the dental clinic. Um, and what I'm told is um, the list is quite long. And so it's just great. I just think it's fantastic that we can bring that service to our students. So I'm looking forward to helping getting the kids down to the middle school stage. And thank you, Richard, for letting us use that space as well. Meredith. Thank you, Sam. Um, so just to add a little bit of dimension to our discussion about data at tonight's presentation, um, you know, Meredith highlighted how this was a challenging administration for us here at the high school this year. Um, you know, one facet of it was the, the collision of the end of the testing window with the end of the first quarter, um, which for some students turned into um, in moments making decisions about, am I going to invest my time and energy? And um, <clears throat> improving my first quarter grade, or am I going to spend that time and energy investing in NUIA? 
Um, and so I think that we had more opt outs this administration than we have had in the past. Um, and that's something that we'll, you know, just have to plan more for next fall. It, the, the timing of things, I don't think will create this, a similar obstacle this spring, but it is something that we'll have to plan for this fall. And at the same time, you know, we have some students who opted out because they needed to focus on their, um, their quarter grades. And we had other students who really value this assessment, really value thinking through um, how they're growing and what their achievement reflects about who they are that they can share with their teachers. Um, <clears throat> We have, um, I was having a conversation in an IEP the other day about a student who um, scores above the 99th percentile on both reading and math, and for whom the NUIA is an over 600 minute investment. Um, the student took over 300 minutes completing both the math and the reading. That was something that that student, um, the study hall teacher reported that when that student would come to study hall, they would say, I'm ready for my login let's get going um, and spent a series of successive study halls working through the test because for him, it is something that, um, you know, that is really important. And I think that, um, you know, that, that student's perspective is reflective of a place to which we are, you know, moving our faculty slowly, but steadily. Um, we are using NUIA um, as one piece of the discussion across context. It's something that you know, for individual students is brought up in 504s and IEPs and SAT meetings, and that in some moments really creates the opportunity to ask a question that otherwise we wouldn't have been able to ask. Um, one example that I can share recently was about a student for whom um, grade-wise everything looked fantastic, um, but there was a teacher who just had an inkling that, that something was needed that wasn't being provided. Uh, so we convened a group of teachers, we're talking about the students, we look at the NUIAs, and the students' NUIA scores um, the, the amount of minutes spent on the test reflected, you know, serious intent, but the score, the achievement levels were dramatically lower than one would have expected for a student with the grades that this student had. And that then opens the door to talking about, um, you know, what is it that this student is needing to do in order to earn these grades with this sort of um, uh, achievement profile and you know, how can we help this student bridge some of the gaps that they seem to be working really, really hard to bridge on their own? Um, so that's one example of, I think, uh, a moment of, of student-specific value added insight um, thanks to the NUIAs. Um, so those conversations are continuing. They're also happening in um, the context of um, goal setting discussions for uh, as part of the uh, supervision and evaluation process. Right when when teachers talk about difficult classes that are presenting a challenge, we get to say, well, have you looked at the growth and achievement profile for this for this class? And then you know we get to do that together and look at where students fall on that quadrant graph and think through the role that those students are playing in that class, um, and and you know using that one on one conversation with those students and with that teacher to um, use NUIA to help problem solve. Um, challenging instructional context or behaviors. Um, other areas of, of growth and improvement that we are um, you know, stepping toward, uh, we have started a, a book study in the math department, um, Productive Math Struggle, a six point action plan for fostering perseverance. Um, I'm really excited about this as a complement to our conversation about math curriculum this year. Um, you know, there's, a, 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 I think Kevin, you know, we've talked, touched on this briefly, but there is a, a wildly divergent um, spectrum of perspectives about best practice in mathematics. And um, in my experience, um, math teachers have very, you know, strongly held beliefs about, you know, where on that spectrum they fall. And this book is bringing uh, to the surface an opportunity to talk about um, you know, what, what the reach of that spectrum implies for our students, especially when it comes to inquiry-based, problem-based um, uh, approach to, to math pedagogy. Um, our teachers are, are really excited about that. And that is going to, that's a year-long book study that, that we're working on. Um, and tomorrow and Thursday, we will be convening a group of eight um, in, in the middle school, um, all purpose room, the room formerly known as the STEAM room, to uh, engage in two days worth of discussion about vision of the graduate in partnership with representatives from NEASC. Um, you know, this is going to anchor 
um, I think some of the, the cross district conversations that we're having and really bring us onto the same page about how uh, we as a school community um, should be structuring the experience of our students in order to make sure that it's true to uh, the community at large. Um, so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that discussion. And that concludes my report for tonight. Thank you, any questions? Actually, I have one question. I don't know if it would be Sam or Meredith or both best to respond, but could, um, could either or both of you say a little bit about uh, the recent change announced to the Bell schedule at the high school? Yes, I can, um, I, I can jump in and Sam, you um, maybe follow up if I miss anything. Um, so this um, was a, a pivot that we um, first started thinking about subsequent to a faculty meeting where we, we did an analysis of the number of students in the building who had Ds and Fs. Um, and I, I wanna say this was shortly after progress reports. Um, and it essentially brought it to the surface and talked about it as a faculty. Like, what, what do we think is going on here and what can we do about it? Um, to be fair, one of the pieces of the conversation that I think is, is going to live in the room for some time is the discussion about the percentage of our, it, uh, the, the percentage of the average class in the high school that has an, either an IEP or a 504. Um, because as you know, we saw in the data report, we're looking at, you know, in some, in some classrooms, we're looking at over 50% of students. Um, and that for teachers presents an acute challenge that, um, you know, we have programmatically not necessarily dug into a way to approach. So, so that was something that was underscored. Uh, but something else that was underscored was the, um, the role that win-win time has played so far this year. Um, so for the um, folks who, who weren't with us for our, our deep inquiry into uh, high school scheduling last spring, um, win-win time was born from uh, an effort to ensure that um, study hall time in the building as a sort of a carte blanche um, was minimized and instead, um, you know, looking at a time where students can connect with teachers to get the kind of support and interventions that make a real difference in learning. Um, and so we started the year having a 30 minute win-win, which is an acronym we stole from ASA last year. It stands for what I need, what you need, um, that uh, in which every faculty member, uh, almost every faculty member was available. Shared staff creates a little bit of a challenge with that, but. Um, every faculty member was available and every student was housed in their advisory um, with a teacher who knows them and can check their grades and find out how things are going and ask them, you know, specific questions. Um, and then we developed a system whereby teachers could tag students, say, you know, I want to see Mark Brewer um, on win-win on Wednesday. Um, you know, he had a really tough time with that social studies test last week and, you know, we need to have a conversation about that. Um, and then Mark's advisor would get that notification and then send Mark to, um, to my room for that 30 minute block and give me a chance to work with him one-on-one. -on -one. Um, that sort of intervention uh, structure was something we did not have last year. Um, and the report in this faculty meeting about D's and F's was that it was proving very um, productive. And uh, the problem with it was that we didn't have enough of it. Um, and so we, you know, put our heads together and, um, you know, talked with our performing arts faculty um, about the fact that they had this protected block of 90 minutes that um, could potentially have some flexibility in it as the longest period by 15 minutes in our, um, our eight day schedule, I'm sorry, eight block schedule, and um, developed a plan whereby we could increase that win-win time and the availability of teachers um, and the, the accessibility of the kind of support that teachers and students, to be fair, were saying was making a difference for them. So what that looked like on the ground was elimination of the 90 minute block on um, Maroon Days and a creation of a 30 minute window in, every, um, in, in the schedule every single day. Right, so we essentially took our white day bell schedule with its 30 minute win-win period, and we made that the schedule that we're working on every day. 30 minutes, we didn't wanna lose advisory, right? We've got to, that's where our student success plans are happening. That's where we're building core relationships that are anchoring students experience in the building. Um, but previously, folks had 15 minutes for advisory on Maroon Days. 
So instead of the 15 minute advisory on Maroon Days, we now have a 30 minute advisory period on Mondays. So every Monday, students spend 30 minutes in their advisory with their advisor. And then Tuesday through Friday, there is win-win time. So now instead of being able to request students either two or three days a week, depending on whether it's a, a, a predominantly white week or not, now teachers can request students four days a week, every Tuesday through Friday. I say that even though today was the first Tuesday of this new schedule um, and we have yet to see how it unfolds. Um, however, when we, um, when we shared with the faculty a survey, so after we made this proposal, um, we gave folks a few days to talk about it and then uh, we surveyed the faculty to find out, faculty, how do you feel about this proposed change? Um, and 85.5% of them said, yes, please, let's go with it. Um, so based on that, you know, resounding support, um, we, you know, gave it a go, even though to be fair, it's sort of an awkward time of year. Um, and we couldn't really identify a lot of reasons why to not try it now, if it's going to make the difference for kids. Um, and so that is the, the change to our schedule. Um, it's that shift is in its infancy, but based on the success of win-win so far, we're, we're really hopeful that it is going to help us address some of the significant challenges that we're seeing, um, some of which you know, are, are due to the fact that we have an, a, an instructional challenge for teachers who have 50% of their room with um, students with 504s and IEPs. Thank you. Uh, one clarification I would make is there, um, Meredith mentioned there was collaboration with the performing arts faculty. There is a kind of a, a, a flex built in to the end of win-win time for students to report to music class so they would have enough time in the block to have it function as we designed it to function. Isn't that right? Yes, that is true. So so that and something else that, that we... Um, that we addressed was that previously win-win time was inaccessible to our performing arts faculty because of the shared schedule and because of the fact that our choir teacher was not here on white days, um, which meant that for performing arts folks, that 30 minute win-win time wasn't, wasn't an option. Uh, but one of the things that we talked about in addition to what Meredith is saying, um, where essentially uh, now uh, performing arts folks with, um, band or orchestra with setup requirements can leave that block five minutes early to get a head start and set up. In addition, we talked about how this will create for them the opportunity to use that win-win time um, at times of year when it would be especially useful, right? So we talked about leading up to um, seasonal performances, how you know a section of the band or even the whole band could be tagged for a win-win and get that extra 30 minutes at a time that would be helpful. Um, so in some ways that there was some time lost in one area, but time gained in, in others. So let, let me ask you this, if a student isn't requested by a teacher, but then also doesn't feel any need to go see a particular teacher, they would just have a regular study hall, is that correct? Yes. That being said, something that is an, another element of um, win-win time as it has manifested so far this year, is the addressing of some of the inequity of access to uh, clubs. So we have had some clubs that have held periodic meetings during win-win time, which for you know, students traveling from long distances without transportation after school has made available to those students opportunities that otherwise wouldn't have been. We've been really explicit about the fact that um, Clubs are only, club meetings are only to be attended by students who are not tagged for academic reasons. And that's something that we're, you know, continuing to try to enforce because of the emphasis of win-win time as an academic period. And for students like those you're talking about, Mark, um, it feels like a, like a really uh, meaningful use of the time to also make accessible opportunities that otherwise would not have been accessible. Thank you. I mean, it's having served on the, you alluded to it at the beginning, right? The uh, scheduling committee, having served on that, there were a lot of ideas that came forward. And, you know, I, I think the clock ran out in terms of getting those all implemented for the fall, but it seems like a lot of the ideas that uh, had a lot of support from the staff and, and everybody on that scheduling committee in terms of improving the schedule, it seems like many of them are starting to come together and get implemented now, including the win-win time, the, uh, least partial opportunity for some club time during the day for equity for 
mostly for non orno students, um, but anybody who's coming to distance. So anyway, it's nice to see that some of those things are getting implemented as the semester goes on and the year goes on. I think it also represents a commitment to, you know, continually assessing, being open to revision, you know, listening to feedback, what's working, what's not working. Um, but admittedly, you know, there's never 100% agreement about these changes. Um, you know, I went home and, and heard two teenagers say, oh, so we're going back to Muse. Maybe you've heard that at your house. I don't know if you have teenagers. I said, no, we're, it's not exactly. Um, there's some key differences in, in what we're doing is uh, expanding on what's worked about this redesigned intervention block um, because the structure of it this year has, I think, been what's made it so uh, visibly impactful. Like we can measure the impact of this time and it's really kind of changed the culture of that time to where it's not, you know, this is my free time, you know, kind of block to, um, you know, if you're, if you're called for a intervention and there's a formal way to do that, that's the priority over other things available to SWAT. So I think it's um, nice to see adjustment happening. And I think it demonstrates the commitment that was stated to, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, where this is going to be the only thing we're going to do next year. We're going to be open to making adjustments as we see them um, being necessary or being um, apparent to us to be needed. Kudos to the high school for that work. Yeah, the phrase culture of continuous improvement comes to mind. Right. right? Absolutely. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I'm piggybacking off your continuous improvement is timely. So I heard twice these um, these book study groups, one at ASA and one at the high school, and uh, these sound fantastic and I'm an enthusiastic supporter. Um, it, I just want to make sure there's money for the books. It is their compensation for the teachers. Teachers often go above and beyond what, what's expected to do and what sort of supports are in place for those teachers that are taking on this additional work and how can we support them? That's to anybody who has an answer. So we do supply the books. I think uh, compensation for book studies is, an, it depends. Usually these are um, designed during PLC time. Um, Sometimes they are offered before or after the school day as options. Um, and I think the ones mentioned are being offered both ways. Thanks. One, another facet of it, Kevin, is that um, teachers earn hours toward recertification for book studies like this. Um, and so that is an element that, you know, it's not monetary compensation, but it, you know, it is serving a purpose um, that is, you know, greater than specifically the book study itself. Anything else? If we can move on to the superintendent report. Um, so you may have seen in the news today, there was a, yeah, I, I guess for the benefit of those who maybe weren't on the email thread, there was a, um, a hoax, a safety hoax, unfortunately impacting a number of schools around the state. Um, we learned of it quite early, I think in the process through just grapevine kind of uh, not a formal channel, um, but soon uh, learned that it was likely uh, this hoax um, that was um, showing up in, in multiple schools. Uh, you know, we immediately sent something out to staff to just let them know what we knew about it and sent the uh, lockdown procedures to all staff. I know uh, we were in an administrative meeting. We ended it as uh, soon as we could and uh, staff took around to subs kind of what to do in the event of us having to initiate a lockdown. Just so, just so you know, if we got a call today like that, we would initiate a lockdown regardless of whether it sounded like what was the hoax or not. And that's really what law enforcement was directing um, schools to do. Um, but just letting staff know of that helped them kind of be prepared and, and hopefully calm students um, if that were to happen. Um, I think you often learn the most when you have more authentic you know, opportunities to practice um, 
So, you know, I'm sure the schools today learned a lot through that process. I know it's really scary for everyone, um, but I'm thankful that it was what it was. Uh, it's unfortunate that that happens. And um, I know of six schools that have impacted. It's probably more than that because it grew throughout the day. I kept hearing about new schools. So, um, you know, we, we actually had a lockdown drill planned uh, in the coming uh, weeks. Uh, we postponed that for a couple of reasons, but we do plan to do that in the near future um, because that's an important um, part of our safety preparedness. Um, related to that, we did an evacuation drill a couple of weeks ago, just after our last board meeting, actually, on the second. Um, and that all went uh, well, and we learned some things. That's why we do drills. And we hadn't done an um, an evacuation drill of that nature since 2019 because we kind of abandoned those kind of drills during pandemic. So uh, for a lot of students, it was their first time doing it. And for you know a lot of us, it was just a reminder about how we do this and what are some of the bumps that we need to figure out. Um, and there were a few of those. Um, there's just a, a lot of people going you know similar directions. It's the nature of our campus, the nature of our um, kind of arteries in and out of the campus. Um, but we will be reflecting on that with the emergency response team to just make any adjustments there. Um, but all in all, it went really well and um, was successful. Um, we don't advertise drills in advance. Uh, that's part of the um, kind of recommendation from law enforcement. You don't let people know that all of your students and staff are going to be pouring out of your building at a given you know, day and time. Um, I think that caught some families by surprise, especially families that maybe, you know, had never done anything like that because they're new to maybe <clears throat> our district or K-12 school. <clears throat> um, so our practices either right after the drill or this one, I set a, uh, a schedule message to go out that would be like five or 10 minutes into the drill just to let parents know what was happening because in Orono, it's a small town and, you know, panic begins to set in when people hear that everyone's pouring out of the school and, you know, evacuating. So that's um, why we did the timing of that notification. Um, finally, uh, in addition to what's coming up, we have a lot of little things tonight to go through. Uh, we had our financial audit recently. Um, our, the auditors were here. They're still in the process of collecting um, follow-up information, they, they did the on-site portion and then they're finishing up by um, other, you know, data collection. So Lynn and Sue and Ben and a number of people uh, are involved in pulling together uh, information. Each school office, uh, you know, their financial um, administrative assistant and our internal accounts. So I expect we'll have uh, the report around the same time we typically do. We usually try to have them come by the end of January meeting to give the report for everyone. And that's the point where we'll have a more an exact figure of what our end of year um, unassigned fund balance uh, ended up to be. So, but no red flags, you know, usually, usually we know if they found, you know, like last year it was, um, some, I think a couple of unsigned um, invoices and uh, when you're the ticket box, there were um, some paperwork they had missed, we had missed in one ticket box. So nothing like that was apparent at the end of the audit. So we look forward to hearing the results of, of this year's audit. Any questions? I mean, just a comment, it's a lot to ask educators to worry about safety on that level. And I know it's stressful and exhausting. So I just appreciate uh, how well everything was handled by everybody, administrators and teachers and staff. Yeah, I mean, you know, I really feel for the, the people. It's, it seems like Sanford had the most stressful situation today because I think they were the first in the wave. Um, and then by the time it was starting to hit other schools, word had kind of gotten around about what had happened there incredibly stressful and scary for everyone involved and the community, right? So, uh, and and for a few moments in our meeting, we didn't know that it was a hoax and really, you know, it was sobering. Um, and so 
you know, relief to know that it was not uh, actually happening, but also just know that it was really impactful and, and traumatic for everyone that we had that experience happen to us in a, in a different way, but it was traumatic for, for our school community. Any other comments, questions? So I don't think we have any discussion items tonight. We had our discussion before the meeting on data tonight. That yep. was the planned item. Yep. So I would make a motion to approve the co-curricular co slate as presented. Is there a second? A second. Just to quickly read it, uh, at the high school indoor track facility, uh, assistant coaches indoor track, Steve Dexter, Emily Francis, varsity cheering winner, Kay Jally, boys varsity basketball at Catala, girls varsity basketball, Derek Sinclair, boys JV basketball, Ryan Charette, uh, boys freshman basketball, Kyle Ames, girls JV basketball, Crystal Fell, Nordic skiing split between Sidney Jack and Ann Ross, unified coach Kevin Mansfield, show choir, Ter Kenny Carter, 80%, Daniel Perkins, 20%, show choir choreographer, Daniel Perkins, show choir music director, Philip Burns, middle school Nordic skiing, Jen Branchflower, assisted by, uh, I think it's Maylee Sapp. Uh, the others are just informational. The others are informational since they're hired uh, through other organizations. So any questions or comments? All those in favor? Passes five to zero. Next up, we have the stipend approvals. So per policy, um, yeah, try, we implemented this idea of a trial stipend where we uh, have it go through this phase in over two years. And then the third year would either be a uh, you know, fish or cut bait. We either approve it permanently or um, not approve it. So we have three of them coming forward this year for this. Meeting, Paris, you want to? Sure. Um, you know, and, and some of this, uh, I think we we are finding our way with how to keep track of when they need to come back through for trial years. Um, and these first two are ones that um, had kind of starts and stops and starts and stops um, along the way. Um, but uh, the middle school GSA has been going strong really with good participation for a couple of years now, um, but didn't move into the trial phase. I mean, it was during pandemic time, so it just was awkward timing. So they are, we're putting them at a year or two now. And um, this, this year, as we are looking at uh, the contract, we'll contemplate um, putting them in for, um, the permanent stipend and the same with environmental club when we do the negotiations uh, work on stipends. So they have really good participation and are consistently doing programming and running programming and they operate um, during uh, lunchtime primarily. And so teachers, uh, you know, that helps make it accessible, but teachers are giving up their lunch time to do the club, but they do it that way to make it more accessible. So that's why it's a stipended program because teachers are doing it on their time that they would normally be eating lunch. Do you want me to talk through all of them or do you want to go one by one? Uh, let's do all three of them, just one motion. Okay. And then the um, environmental club, this one, um, because it's been going so strong for about two years now, uh, I think it was just like my oversight. And I think, you know, Sean and I started talking about it and realized that it was, we had an environmental club four years ago and then the students graduated and it kind of um, <clears throat> became one of those that, you know, interest waned and so we phased out the stipend. And then we had students interested and it kept going, got going again and I think Sean and I both, uh, you know, didn't realize that we didn't have that stipend anymore. We just forgot that it had been phased out. And so when we realized that, we really feel like this one needs to skip year one and just go straight into year two this year because it's going gangbusters, as you probably know and have heard, and really feel like it should, you know, be accelerated to that phase and be sent into full um, implementation with a full stipend beginning next school year. 
Um, and then finally, the school garden project. This is a new um, stipend request. Uh, it, you know, it's similar to what we're doing at ASA with Greenhouse Coordinator. Uh, this has been kind of a passion project that started during pandemic time uh, with some funds that Jess um, was able to secure and we helped uh, with some um, other ESSER funds. And it's just really grown to be, you know, a really great part of um, middle school is using it a lot, but it's also connecting down with ASA now and just has, uh, you know, tie-ins to our summer programming, doing a lot there with, you know, the robust growing season. So, um, you know, we really think it's a worthwhile stipend to keep that going um, since we've had a nice initial investment to get get it on established and Jess is also doing a great job of um, of securing grants for for helping to you know outfit and expand what's out there so the, this would be year one at ASA there's a stipend for a greenhouse coordinator help keep the, you know, greenhouse, um, <clears throat> you know, plants thriving and growing and watered and such. Okay, I would make a motion to approve the OMS GSA trial, second year trial, OHS Environmental Club second year trial and OMS School Garden first year trial stipend. Is there a second? A second. Discussion or questions? <laughs> I mean, these all seem like exciting programs, many of which are already going robustly. So actually all of them in some form going robustly already. So that's all awesome. Uh, any other questions? All those in favor? Passes five to zero. Next up, the budget cost center transfer. And you heard Meredith mention the um, audit. So one of the laws is the, um, the budget that's passed you know, ultimately through the board and then through the town meeting and then through the, the ballot vote is um, not to exceed. But within the law, we are allowed to transfer up to 5% of one cost center just by board vote into another cost center. So we kind of plan for that by building all of our uh, uh, contingency funds into the largest cost center, which is regular ed. And then if there's a need to move funds between cost centers, we can do that. Basically, after the audit, it you know came forward that uh, we'd exceeded one cost center by fifteen thousand, so we need to move some money to account for that. It was and that was actually for a different reason. And I, I confirmed with okay. Len, and it was energy costs. Was okay. this okay. the? I thought when I was talking to Brian earlier, I thought it was the bleachers. The bleachers were contemplated in another way with a, a signing forward from a previous year. So it was the energy cost increases that sent this cost center over, which is not unexpected. Right. Not unexpected or pretty yeah. classic use of contingency funds. Right. But again, the contingency funds sit in regular ed because it's the biggest cost center. So it's the easiest to move it to any other cost center. Yeah. So we need a formal motion from the board and provide that to the auditor from the minutes to uh, Yep. Clean that up enough. That. So I move to approve the allowable budget transfers between cost centers recommended by the auditor to remove the over expenditure in the cost centers, decrease regular instruction by 15,000, increase facilities maintenance by 15,000. This is for the fiscal uh, for the school year, well, for fiscal year 2022, last fiscal year. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor? Okay. Next up, uh, Honeywell Contract for HVAC. You want to introduce that? You want me to? Sure. Uh, anyway. uh, you want me to do it? Sure. I'll start. Brian, right, we'll start with the technical details. Um, we've been working for a year and a half or so um, with Honeywell on um, a plan to upgrade. Uh, we started with a couple of areas and narrowed down to one area um, that we wanted to focus some of our ESSER money to help um, upgrade uh, part of our system that's in an older design phase than the rest of the school. 
Um, and so we've narrowed that down to the first and second grade wing down day. So we've talked to you about this at a couple of different points in the planning process. We're at the point now where we have final, um, they've solicited bids and have costs that they've provided to us and they've segmented out um, the scope of work into three um, kind of options and given us cost um, options with those. Um, we started out wanting to do that. That's the area that has the large, uh, what do you call the things? Yeah, the hallway plenum. Yeah, that, the, uh, the large round tubes running through the hallways, okay? And so that's the system that provides ventilation um, through doorway grates and under doors through the, the large um, hallway plenum uh, system. And we want to create a system that has um, more controllable um, airflow and ventilation to all the rooms. And our initial goal was to provide um, univents in each of those rooms as well. The univent portion, uh, we have had to pull out of the project due to cost. We just don't have the money to fund that right now. So what you see here, I'm gonna pitch it to Brian in a second to talk about the specifics of HVAC design because that's not my lingo, um, is the scaled down project. We have, we, we asked them to have, hand us, give us something that we could do with $600,000 because between the um, state um, revolving renovation fund, SREF, and what we had budgeted in our ESSER three money, we felt like you know around $600,000 is what we could spend to upgrade that um, project. So you know what can you do for 600,000 is what we asked them. And so this is what we got back. And it's more than 600,000, as you can see. Uh, they've given us two options to do uh, A and option A and B, which are our prioritization. A and B are the top two priorities, come in at 622,000. And then when you add an option C, it's at 770,000. Um, and so I'm gonna pitch it to Brian to really explain what A, B, and C are. And then I will talk about other money possibilities if we want to consider, you know, all three. Do you, I have an extra one. So, yeah. Okay. You guys have to eat, Brian? Yeah. yeah. Oh, you okay. do? Okay. I mean, you don't have to look at the drawings, but don't look at drawings. But uh, basically, A is taking the classrooms in the first and second grade wing that are kind of like on the walls, the outside walls, the perimeter. And uh, really it's about the return ducts. Right now that system is set up that the return air, right? So these are central central uh, heating, so air and heating and ventilation, right? They're not air conditioning, but they're heating and ventilation. So there's warm air that goes through ducts into those buildings, into those rooms. And right now the air returns since you're pushing air in, you have to have air coming back. The air is like going out the grates and the doors into the hallway, back down to the air conditioner, which is known as the central plenum. Plenum is the place where you collect the air. And then it goes back into the uh, heating system, gets heated up, gets filtered, you know, critically during COVID, it's getting, still getting filtered. It's getting more 13 filtered. Uh, but that uh, the idea of using the hallway as a return is, is a dated idea. And, and, you know, it's it's grandfathered in the code, but we, that's what we're trying to address is get out of that up to date. So really, basically, what this is doing is uh, putting in ductwork from each room, so that the air that is coming back is coming individually from each room and not going through the hallway centrally. Uh, there's some benefits from that from a fire safety point of view as well. So really, I. I I think that's a that's a pretty obvious no brainer to go ahead and do that. The B part of the project is addressing the area that uh, used to be well, it was a temporary office during construction, and now it's very special uh, need special need education rooms uh, that have basically just baseboard heat. They don't have air ventilation, and so getting it's basically an air quality issue in those rooms to get air quality into them. So that's A and B. Uh, C is a uh, future preparation. 
It's basically adding some increased capacity on the hot water and running a spine of pipes uh, basically to within you know a few feet of each classroom. The idea is that C would allow us, you know, we have this idea of rotating upgrades for rooms when we do a rotating upgrade to go and put a univent into that room. So it basically gets all of the prep work for univents done, and then we could do a univent room by room by room, which current prices look like it's about 70k. So if we don't if we don't do C, right, the original goal was to do univents everywhere. Univents have just served us incredibly well. This is a univent, right? It's a wall unit. Uh, the thing under the bike is a univent. Most of the high school, most of the middle school have univents. Um, and they, you know, they're very nice because they access outside air to the extent that that's possible. To the extent that it's not, they cycle it through a MERV 13 filter and silent univent. And all the heating is happening inside of that unit. So you have local room control over the thermostats instead of central control, right? Where one teacher wants it hotter and one teacher wants it colder. Uh, but that was that was well into the seven figures. I forget what it was, 1.1, and I think it might even have gotten up to 1.7 because of the way construction costs are going. So uh, that was just off the table. But this would, I still think that's the vision. That's that's you know what we've had in a lot of places. So this would uh, get all of the infrastructure in place, so we literally could just one room at a time pick it off with the units if we wanted to in the future. I should say option C has no direct benefit for today. It is entirely a preparation and infrastructure issue. We, you know, we could come up with money that's SRF or um, ESSER, we're still coming up about 50, 70K short. So the question is, you know, do we want to push that 50, 70K stretch? Obviously, in a district the size we can find 50 to 70 k but do we want to do that so we have that prep work for new events in the future? So, I mean, just to summarize, I think Meredith and I, and I and Bill, who's been part of this, always very strongly recommend going ahead with A and B. The money's lined up. A lot of that money's use it or lose it money anyway. So, and to me, it's a no-brainer. We should do A and B, although we have to vote on that as a board tonight. The question is C, whether we do this prep work that gets us prepared for unit events and then stretches us a little bit, and then we have to come up with 50 to 70K. And I think, you know, Meredith and I talked this afternoon, I, I would recommend going ahead, um, but but it's not as much of a no-brainer, so that should come to the board. Is there a point to do that with this as opposed to? Is there any cost savings? There's cost savings just in terms of setup with contractors coming in. Also, one of the units that they're upgrading to have the capacity for the pipes is part of what's in A. So it's it's sizing A correctly, right? Whereas you might have, if we were to try and do C in the future, that's the way to break it. It's not saving us money on A and B, but if we were to try to do C in the future, it definitely costs more. I don't have a number, but 50% would or even 100% would shock me. And I think it also allows us to do that final step in phases that are a little uh, easier to bite off in smaller chunks if we have the infrastructure already there allows us to do it you know room by room if we need to to get the units there it's hard to find you know a million dollars to do the whole project at once if that ends up you know seven unit events at seventy five thousand is not a second million and then you know the hundred and fifty so thousand for the um, infrastructure allows us to spread out those costs a little more. And so see, is it hot water that it's meeting? So is that what you said? Or it's the yeah, so that univent has a hot water pipe going into it. So the, the, the hot water is heated centrally. I don't remember off the top of my head where those pipes are coming from, but some, some unit up on a roof somewhere is heating hot water. And so the univent is taking a mixture of outside air and filtered room air, running it across hot water coils and blowing it back into the room. And it's you know locally controlled, so it's tied to a thermostat, and it's also tied to a CO2 sensor in this room. So that's that's why I think unit events um, actually sort of an old-fashioned technology. When we talk to engineers, they get excited about something else. But when I talk to teachers uh, who like having a thermostat that's in their own room, um, you know, and the CO2 sensor is tied to that room, so if the air quality is going down in that room, it kicks in. It's not averaging across 10 rooms. So 
that's why we're pushing towards unit vents. And yeah, so basically what it's doing is it's extra capacity on the roof to heat water and running the pipes basically to within proximity because they're going to be up there doing duct work. They're doing the return duct work anyway, running that pipe work out. It's kind of all but the last mile, right? So then we would just have to run uh, pipe work from that central pipe spine over to a wall, throw the hole through the wall and slap the unit vent in. So the unit vents are the main cost in that. The labor costs are pretty small at that point. So, um, so Brian, as Brian indicated, we um, we really it would cost around we think um, sixty thousand dollars more than we had already planned for in our budget that we presented a couple of meetings ago around capital improvement. We'd added that line for HVAC fifty thousand dollars to contribute to the HVAC project at ASA. Um, it would require an additional sixty thousand beyond that from our funds. So either from you know, our unassigned fund balance from our capital reserve account. And it's, you know, admittedly 60,000 less dollars that we have to spend on the list of things we want to do, or, you know, that's available for the list of things we want to do. But flip wise of that 150K extra, right? 90K of that is, I mean, the SREP is use it or lose it money. The SREP money is also use it or lose it, but it could be used in other places, but at the moment, there's not. I think it, using ESSER money for this is the best way to use ESSER money because it doesn't create a, a cliff of, you know, personnel expenditures that suddenly you don't have the money to fund ongoing positions. And it's a core, you know, I think outcome of the pandemic that we've learned that, you know, we want to optimize ventilation as much as possible. And we, we know where we have, um, you know, we optimize that system with MERV 13 but it's optimized as much as it can be optimized with the design that it is. And we would like to improve the design of that space. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm convinced, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll just wanna ask for the record. So since we would be extending ourselves to do all three, is there any, or not any possibility, how likely is it that this is still an underestimate. And so we stretch ourselves and then the actual bill comes in and we're really overstretched. So these are bids guaranteed through December. No. So if you sign on. The, the stretching has happened several times, but the, this, <laughs> this is the moment where we have guaranteed bids from contractors in, or subcontractors through Honeywell on the table. So if we act now, the answer is it's not possible. Oh, okay. Um, so. is, is there any possibility that we put this infrastructure in and then it becomes outdated before we actually get around to extending. I don't think so because it's mostly just hot water piping and heating units. Heating units got what 20, 30 year lifespan. So okay. yes, there could be a more efficient unit that comes along, but it's still gonna work for it. You know, what's up there would still work. Great, thank you. Bill, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I just think that no, I, I think uh, there's been some questions asked and, you know, it's like Brian said, uh, we've got a set price now. If we wait and go down the road another two years, it's going to cost us more to run piping. They're already here. The contractors are already on site. Um, I will say the state, I said on a meeting here a while back, <clears throat> the state is actually pushing to go to, uh, like we put in down at ASA, those uh, overhead units and getting away from a lot of the things they're doing now like the unit events, uh, but that's where people that don't have um, natural gas, they're trying to get everybody off of, off of uh, two floor. So we wouldn't, it really wouldn't fit for us, but I think Mark, your question was, are we gonna get a date? I, I don't think so. You're gonna see these around for quite a while. I mean, trains still making them. I, I really don't see them going on a date for quite a few years now. Sure. You say the contractors are anything else? This will be next summer, but they're ready to sign a contract with us. Yeah, and, cool. and they say we need to sign the contract to get materials ordered so that it can be installed next summer. What's that? No, because I mean, right now it's going to get a contract to do anything. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're kind of in a queue because we've been working with them well and so forth, but uh, the you know, supply chains that they have to, we have to sign the contract now or the cost goes up and they, 
they have to order the parts now or they're not going to be here for next summer. This really only since it's you know, walking through classrooms constantly can only be done in the summer. Couldn't be done over a winter break, so it really has to happen next summer. Yeah, let's go for A, B, and C. Yeah, Okay, I would make a motion to authorize the superintendent to execute the contract with Honeywell to do the construction work for A, B, and C for a cost of 700, let's just say not to exceed 800,000 fixed price, but just for a second. One second. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Okay, passes five zero. Two grants, you want to introduce first one there? Uh, sure, so uh, we had two groups applying for um, grants with the Maine Environmental Education Association. The first one here is um, one for the outdoor garden that Jessica Archer submitted. And this is one of the grants I was referring to that she's been pursuing to help um, just continue to fund um, and augment the garden. And so she I, um, provided the uh, award letter here. Some of the things she's planning to purchase with that uh, are um, um, perennials, um, pollinator structures, um, other maintenance items, uh, soil, uh, some seed and seedlings, um, and then also some instructional materials to go with that, um, uh, magnifying glasses, gloves, uh, journals for uh, student um, observation, some uh, reading materials that connect in and some portable bins. She also has um, ideas for some signage that uh, she hopes to put out in the space as well. So. Um, I am definitely recommending that we support the acceptance of that grant. So I would make a motion to approve the $1,500 mini grant for outdoor learning uh, for the garden. For a second. Second. And just to remind everybody the reason these large grants come to the board is just to make sure there's you know, alignment with program values and there's no long term obligations that. Um, Seem problematic. So that's what we're going to see. see. See a good fit on this one. Any other questions? All those in favor? Passes 5 0. And the other one? Yeah. So the second one, uh, Noah uh, partnered with Kim O uh, to submit. So, um, Noah, do you want to introduce it since you were yeah, the yeah. co author? Sure. Um, basically, there's this little space on the map. There across the street from Mesa, or the Crafty Roof Road, that's owned by the town, it's the same parcel as the rest of the school, and or at least part, same parcel as the other house right next to the school. And the idea is basically just to use it's a little bowl. It's sort of a part of it is like a wetland, like a cover pool. There's a lot of it that's uh, uh, goldenrod, sort of some forest, and the idea is basically to use develop that space as somewhere that's right across the street that kids can get around in this classroom space and actually have used it a little bit and cleared a little bit of a trail in there for some of the kids to use and they did it once or twice. The idea for the grant is basically to um, just very primitive stuff in there, some picnic tables, some benches, try to explore the space, also to test the soil to make see if there's like what sort of environmental hazards may be in there um, and uh, just to make it usable um, and just the basic primitive sort of stuff that you'd have out your classroom as well. And it's a little exploratory too to see how, how it develops. So the only thing about this is I, I do believe that this is on town owned yeah. property. So we reached out to the town um, to um, work with them to see if they will allow this uh, kind of you know, minimal development and use of this of this space. Um, we already use that side of the road for informal, right? You see classes over there doing reading time out, you know, the edge of the St. Mary's field and such. Um, and so when I when Noah and I talked about this, um, you know, I think the idea is if that ends up not working, that they will seek another area on our property to 
implement the same idea. This is the ideal spot and we hope this works out. But I think another area somewhere on the hill potentially right now where there are all the, you know, Orno tree club garden uh, area that we could um, create something in that space. And, and I'll say also that, you know, there's this ideal potential. There's this other parcel you see there that is privately owned that potentially the, you know, just we would never would require, but if they would grant us access, we could walk on that item. That would be a conversation about the need space stuff. Potential. And so this would basically provide just like benches and picnic tables. Benches, picnic tables, um, some maintenance like to clear the trails a little bit, and then also soil testing we could yeah. to to simulate more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there is there actually is on part on the back of the east side there is a little little like dump area so yeah it kind of is in the bottom up where the runoff from that those yeah houses parking lots up there i think there's a lot we learned about you know how the flow of our um, runoff goes when we did the uh, pond out here so um there's a lot happening over on that side of the road I guess one other piece, you know, the, there's a part of it too where there's a forest and there's some just some standing snags that are great habitat for the woodpeckers, but potentially hazards for the kids. And maybe looking at if, if we already use that, if we want to take to take it over. Great. I would make the motion to authorize the district to accept the uh, Maine Environmental Education Association mini grant for the outdoor learning space for learning classroom. Is there a second? Any second. Any discussion or questions? Thank you, Noah, for uh, for telling us. Yeah. All those in favor? Passes five zero. Uh, one policy. Come forward. Minor revisions. Uh, so this is up in front of me. IKFD, which is the. Um, Is it in the, uh, yeah, there it is. There it is. Okay, no files. No excuse for not finding it. So all this is this was brought to us by Rebecca Cross, who's our uh, adult ed director, and who noticed the policy was not consistent with current state law. So it's just updating the science requirement and the social studies requirement to exactly match the uh, main state law for. Uh, this is adult eds uh, who get a diploma for the adult ed program if they could not get a high school diploma. And thanks to Mark, we found a few missing periods and typos, but um, that's that's all that's in it. Been through policy committee and uh, coming forward tonight. So I would make a motion to adopt policy IKFB as revised. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor? Okay. Yes, it's five zero. So truck. Yeah, so um, we, Bill and Lynn have been working this fall to secure um, quotes for the truck purchase. As you recall, we um, budgeted for the truck in our budget this year, maintenance truck. And we increased our revenue from um, our capital reserve to cover this expenditure that we put into the budget we put 40,000 in the budget for this um, truck purchase. Um, between the time that um, quotes were obtained, which was challenging to get even enough quotes this, uh, it, with a shortage happening, um, when we, they talked to me and we circled back, they're like, oh, now it's too late for 2022 models. Um, so we had to circle back and get 2023 quotes. And at this point, we could only get one person to give us a 2023 quote on the kind of truck we're looking for, um, which is, you know, a work truck, you know, kind of no frills um, um, model. 
And this model, though, was actually better than the 2022 quotes because um, I think those quotes were what was available in the inventory that they could secure. And this one, we're just conceding, we're just going to order it and get what we want for the, you know, for the uh, more reasonable price for to not have any additional features that we don't want. Um, so based on this compared to what we had for the other quotes, we feel like, you know, this meets the policy of needing to obtain multiple quotes and we need to bring this to you so we can order it. And then, um, you know, I think it'll take, I don't, I don't remember how long. Eight to 12 weeks. Yeah, I think that's probably optimistic based on <laughs> other people I know who've had to order trucks and how long it's taken. Um, but to get this going and get this uh, into service and get it expended this fiscal year, we need to go ahead and get moving on that. So I'll bring you this upon the recommendation of Bill Owen. So I would authorize the superintendent to execute a purchase of uh, the truck as quoted, not to exceed 40,000. Is there a second? Second. Yeah, yeah please. Is there, is there a plan eventually maybe to put a plow on the truck or I know the town does our stuff, but. We don't, we didn't buy anything that would have a plow package because we contract with Black Bear for anything the town doesn't do. Um, we are planning to do a couple of things to this that we didn't put in the quote and just do it after market. That's the tow package, right? We're going to do a tow hitch and a, uh, a lift gate in the back because we're lifting a bunch of stuff yeah. now. So we'll do a aluminum lift gate in the back and just spray bed liner. And that's yeah. pretty much it. It's an eight full eight foot bed. and. The other thing is this also going, one of the reasons it's cheaper, we're not buying it off the lot, we're going to the commercial side of the house. So. Any other questions? All those in favor? Okay. Yep. Okay, so five zero. Uh, subcommittee reports. Policy subcommittee. We hit the J's, which is student policy. There's a lot of really meaty policies, and a lot of policies we decided we needed more. It's not a section of the uh, policies that have been updated recently. We come up to 2011-2015. So we're we're doing research on those policies, and um, yeah, seeing what the you know if we're out of date with current policies and things like that. So we'll be bringing a slew of those back probably after the next policy subcommittee meeting and then finishing up the rotation, which we're getting pretty close to. Anything from UTC? Nope. Anything from Spruce? Yeah, we did have our first meeting of the year last week. Um, we went over enrollment numbers, both at the multi-handicap facility and the day treatment facility. We approved the purchase of a um, security type system where um, instead of having staff having walkie talkies, um, which other people can scan and figure out what's going on, it's like a card system that they carry on them and like one, it's got a clicker on it, one click is for this, two clicks is for that, three clicks is for that. Um, they were able, I guess the Bangor school system is having this put in, so they were able to piggyback off that and um, have a lot of savings. We also approved spending some money to remove um, asbestos from an old tower. I don't know if anyone's familiar. Mark, you used to be up Bruce, right? You know that big tower there? They're starting the first step of removing that oh, tower. Yeah. yeah, and step one is getting the asbestos out of it. So um, be we approved that. <laughs> <laughs> and then probably the biggest news was um, their director has stepped down. Um, so in Meredith, I I guess I'll look for you for, um, I'm assuming that was relatively recent, right? Yeah, I, mean, we I learned of it since, last uh, week. I think I learned of it last week and your meeting was last week. Yeah, but, yeah. No, I think we learned of it just before the meeting. Okay. Um, so I guess they're looking at the interlocal agreement to figure out how, um, how we get a new director and how the rules of that play, right? Yeah, I, I haven't been to a meeting we haven't had a meeting since that news came out yeah. um i mean it it typically has been very intertwined with bangor school department but when uh the superintendent there were, uh, retired Stayed out. yeah i think just the new there was an interim it's kind of you know 
been through several um, kind of shifts in, in that role. So, I, I mean, we do need a director, but I guess it's unclear to me if it has to be someone who's hired just to do that, or if someone, some school department, some district can take on. And they're having the, uh, the attorney take a look at the interlocal agreement to see exactly how that would work, and what they can do and what they can't do. Curriculum subcommittee. The curriculum committee met on uh, recently. The tenth. The tenth. Thank you. Yeah, actually, I have the notes here from me. But met, met on the tenth and um, just clarified uh, the curriculum review cycle. Spent some time kind of assigning some potential years to that and answering some questions that uh, teachers had about what we tell our departments. You know that kind of thing. So. Um, clarified some of that, and they also spent quite a bit of time looking at the documents that have been developed by the technology in, um, committee and the instructional technology committee. Uh, those statements and uh, some of that scope and sequence will be ready to share with you at the Jane, uh, December meeting. Um, and got some really good feedback and um, thoughts from the curriculum committee to incorporate and bring back to the, the technology committee before that comes to the board. And um, then ran out of time. <laughs> so our next meeting is December 8th at 3.30. And we really hope to um, focus that work on assessing bias and standards and curriculum and looking at some of the works that we um, can discuss about the best ways to use them in our district to the right skills class. Great. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Facilities and Building Committee. <laughs> We keep uh, the you know the last little pieces keep on keep oning. So we got notice today that winter set in. I can't put the grass down on the football field. I think they were as disappointed as we were, but um, you know they did get the the fill in and uh, or almost there. They're going to do that soon. Finish it very shortly, uh, and it's you know it's like night and day. <laughs> They got rid of the rocks and uh, they put in fill with sand in it. So um, that's all good. Um, I think we, this is news fresh today. We haven't had the conversation, but obviously our next agenda is to make sure that we're not impacting the track um, season next spring. Uh, they may, they probably, the grass needs time to grow. So they're probably, the interior of the track may be off limits for a while, but uh, um, you know, most. That affects javelin. Most of anyway, that's our goal is to make sure that the other than javelin, that the um, schedule still doesn't affect the track season. Um, but that's the update on the football field. So you know, we got almost there, and then you know, if the weather held out one more week, I think we would have had the grass down, but it didn't. So uh, and then we had a meeting with. Um, with our architects, still some little issues, mostly of them relating to some form of HVAC. Um, speaking about the individual thermostats, they failed to get that set up in one place and we're having a fight over who's going to pay for it. Um, and in another place, there's a coil that, you know, burst or broke down and the debate over how to fix it and how much it costs to fix it. Right. Everybody wants to be somebody else's fault that it broke. These are the usual kinds of things as you're mopping up big construction, but um, that's that's big stuff that's, uh, yeah, I mean, really, we're getting that with pretty small potatoes on the big construction. We, we're not 100% turned the corner into our locally managed projects, but we're, we're definitely well turning on the corner. How are the pieces of auditorium? Yeah, that's definitely still in, in progress. And as we do our first big production, you know, and using things in ways we haven't had to use it yet, um, it's different to just have someone in a speaking using one microphone than having the full sound system. So there's certain things we're learning and having to go back and ask for updates. We're still finalizing a punch list to confirm that things were done to satisfaction from the punch list um, and still reporting, you know, a few functionality issues that 
we're discovering, like, you know, like in other areas as we began to use them um, or having to have them come back to address things. So um, I would say the technical part of the auditorium is where we're still, you know, learning things and having to ask questions and go back to, you know, get technical assistance. That's still that's still uh, still being pushed. Yeah, they've come to look at it. Think they think they found what it is, but we have to. Someone with really good ears needs to go in in really quiet moments when the AC is running or the HVAC running just right to see if it's actually fixed. We basically they tighten some stuff up and then we have to prove there's still a sound there. Hopefully there's not a sound there. Now. I think that's the highlight from facilities. Yeah. Uh, wellness committee. Yeah, I think we're going to meet December 12th at 2.30. Uh, and what's on the agenda? PEI leadership team, I, mean, I think you heard most of the update last time, right? Breaking into five sort of sub, they're not really subcommittees because they're drawing on more people than the original group, but uh, five committees to start implementing an action. And they're going to meet for a couple of months, December and January. And then the DEI leadership is going to meet back at the end of January. Most of those dates are on the calendar already. Unless either of you would add. Okay. Um, any other business? Any requests for future agenda items? Any public comment? The floor is open for public comment. We must be getting to the non-controversial part of the year. I don't see a single non-board employee person at the meeting. Um, some ways a sign, I guess things are going well. So our next board meeting is December 6th, Thursday at 6 p.m. Uh, here in the library or on Zoom. Tuesday. Tuesday. Always do that. And our discussion topic for that night is um, the tech committee is bringing an update about tech. Instructional work. technology. Yes. yes. So a request for information or follow up. I don't have a request for information, but I'd just like to thank Susan again for the data presentation. I feel like you know, Mark and Jake and I have been watching that more for over 10 years and it used to be like, you know, spit out a bunch of graphs from the WIA five, an hour before the meeting. Before that, was not. <laughs> well, yes, we were all on the board when there, were, there was no ability to access our WIA data as a district. So anyway, we've come a long ways and I, I feel like we're in a good place and I appreciate the work that went into it. Uh, I would motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Pass is 5 0. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Oh, by the way, Brian, sheds down. <laughs>